So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Lakshin, who is a world-renowned clinician, educator, and researcher specializing in lupus and other autoimmune-related chronic illnesses. Dr. Lakshin is the former editor-in-chief of the journal Arthritis and Rheumatology and has authored over 300 peer-reviewed medical publications. Dr. Lakshin has previously lectured at the SLA workshop on topics related to the future of lupus care research, the impact of uncertainty, and lupus-related brain fog. So without further ado, I'm going to um, ask Dem if we could start sharing the PowerPoint. Um, and then, and then we'll go ahead and get started on the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lakshin. Okay, uh, delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see the uh, folks uh, on the screen. I'm gonna talk about a topic that uh, is heavily related to lupus, but is uh, not about lupus itself. And that is that uh, the high frequency with which uh, patients have clear-cut abnormalities but uh, don't carry a diagnosis of lupus. And that's something that I've referred to as when a diagnosis uh, has no name. Uh, I should say, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Part of this invitation today uh, comes from a conference that we held, initially planned to be held in the spring of uh, 2020, postponed by the uh, pandemic, but then conducted virtually uh, from April 27th and 28th in 2021. Uh, and by the way, you can uh, access the entire conference uh, with the website that's listed. What this conference was about was diagnostic uncertainty. And it differed from uh, most discussions of this field by including a very wide range of uh, participants, not just doctors, uh, but patients, uh, clinical researchers, basic researchers, uh, people from pharmacology, lawyers, medical philosophers, uh, uh, people from uh, uh, hospital and federal administrators uh, who determine funding for illnesses. Uh, and in that sense, the conference was a very broad ranging one. We did publish a short review of it uh, and I've listed and can supply you with it on request. Uh, the copy of a paper about that, and uh, a book, uh, which will be much more extensive uh, and cover all these areas, is going to be published later this summer. Uh, next, please. Okay, so um, the question comes up, uh, why are diagnoses uncertain? Part of it has to do with the definitions and rules for making diagnosis names. Another uh, part of it has to do with the uh, purpose for which people use uh, diagnosis names. And we went on in that uh, to ask why are diagnoses uncertain? How often they, are they? Uh, what happens to you as a patient and to the doctor uh, when diagnoses are uncertain? And we conclude with some ideas about how we can make the life better for everyone in the future. Next, please. Everyone here probably has encountered this at, uh, at some point. Uh, you see a doctor, the doctor says, I don't really know what's wrong. And Therefore, and there are several likely responses. Uh, a common one is I can't help go somewhere else, but without much guidance about where to go and why. Another very common issue uh, when a diagnosis is not explained is that patients are shamed by it. They're told, oh, it might, I can't make a diagnosis, so it must be in your head, uh, a truly false approach to life. Another one is, uh, it's sort of like loop, 
lupus, for instance, so that's what I mean by X. So I'm going to treat it as it is, is uh, lupus, but I could be wrong. And so we're going to take some chances. Uh, and then the final one is uh, just simply say it doesn't fit a pattern, but I can get into the depths of what is going on. And some of these things I know how to treat, whether or not we have a name for it. Next, please. So regarding rules for naming a diagnosis, next. A diagnosis, the word diagnosis, it's just a name. And it's a name for a pattern of abnormal symptoms and labor, laboratory tests. And there's no logic, there's no rule of what symptoms have to be present or not. Uh, one diagnosis will have a series of symptoms and other will depend heavily on laboratory tests. Others will depend on uh, intuition. But there isn't, if you try to define the word diagnosis, there's no boundary to that uh, 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 term. Uh, most often, well, we're coming from an era where uh, pattern recognition was the main reason for using a name. And we're moving into an era in which we're looking at the biological process or what we're called uh, 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 patient-specific medicine. A diagnosis is also a theory. And when I uh, see a patient, uh, when patients appear, you don't come in and say, on day one, this is a diagnosis, you get a, a, a theory of uh, what might be happening and you end up uh, ruling in and ruling out uh, by doing tests and eventually uh, landing on a name that fits. Now, from almost every public point of view, about, diagnosis has boundaries. Uh, and I'm going to go into that in, in a bit more, but uh, you may have to have a specific blood test or specific symptoms. You can't just throw anything into the uh, mixture. And something that uh, is not considered very much at all when we talk about diagnoses is the time uh, diagnoses are very much time limited. Uh, a person who's sick at 18 is different at age 30 and is different at age 50, uh, both from the point of view of normal growth and development and from the point of view of uh, uh, the effects of the illness and its treatment. Similarly, science changes. So a term that we may have used uh, uh, 10 years ago may long may no longer be applicable, even though the way in which we record it uh, is, uh, uh, hasn't changed. The next, please. Okay. One of the uh, major defects about diagnosis is it takes basically only the um, patient's physiology uh, into account uh, and does not look at socioeconomic status. For instance, when does a person first even consider seeing a doctor? What access does this patient have to uh, expertise in medical care uh, and so on? And diagnosis almost never takes into account uh, the contributions of uh, heritage, which could include something as simple as you have a different diet than I do, uh, your beliefs about what is and is not uh, a, an important manifestation uh, of an illness, and your personal choices. I'm, I'll do this. I don't want to do that, uh, that sort of thing. But they all affect what we end up using diagnoses names for. Next, please. So uh, it won't surprise you in, uh, uh, in the introduction, you heard a little about this. I've actually thought about this for uh, uh, a long time. Uh, in, uh, when I was at NIH, and then when I came back to uh, uh, Hospital for Special Surgery in 1997, uh, I had written a book about uh, what amounted to diagnostic on, certainty. Uh, it had to do with the 
uh, rules that were coming up that were changing the way in which we were doing the worlds in which first diagnosis related groups and ID, ICD codes became the way in which we, we recorded a, a patient's illness. Uh, they made it much more systematic and much less flexible. Several years later, uh, a patient of mine uh, whom I had known for a very long time uh, and who had first became ill in her teens, currently she's in her uh, 60s, uh, has gone through an entire lifetime of not being given a diagnosis. Uh, and the book is uh, contrasting chapters of how she saw parts of life and about how we saw them and how we then ended up trying to just negotiate why her views and my views differ on how to deal with this. And then uh, another decade uh, later, uh, I wrote about uh, the concept of diagnostic uncertainty and uh, uh, how to bring that concept to the world. And that's how we got into the conference that we have. Next, please. So the, why did I write the books? Well, partly because it's I, I'm compulsive and do things like that. Uh, but I also wanted to make it easier and better uh, uh, to treat patients. And I also was very cognizant in this with Alita Brill of the second uh, book. Uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, patients do not, are not uh, conflicted with loss of dignity and humiliation that comes when people don't understand what uh, the problem may be. Next, please. Uh, the other thing is simply to talk to uh, patients. Uh, yeah, we have to have a vocabulary that we can discuss this kind of thing uh, with many, most patients come in and say, what's the diagnosis as if it's a straightforward symptom. Uh, and the other thing, and uh, something we discussed just before this conference began, is the uh, issue that current billing uh, codes uh, do not allow uh, the concept of uncertain diagnoses. So physicians end up having to upgrade the certainty uh, when they write uh, a prescription for a medication or for a, uh, a diagnostic test. If you say it's not uh, a definitive or you're chasing a uh, line of thinking, uh, generally you won't get paid for uh, or the test will be refused uh, and so on. And this is actually a big problem with management of medicine today. It has nothing to do with the actual issue of uh, diagnosis. Next. Well, in terms of uh, what makes diagnoses uncertain, we have uh, two types of criteria that are used for uh, making a diagnosis. Next, uh, please. The people generally think of diagnostic criteria, and that's uh, an abnormality or set of abnormalities that must be present and has no other possible explanation. If you get hit by a car and have a fractured arm, that's very clear uh, uh, statement. It's very and uh, irrefutable. Uh, blood cultures, if you have uh, infections, uh, biopsies for you have cancer, would make diagnoses very clear and uh, 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 definitive. Uh, such diagnostic criteria do not exist for any other rheumatic diseases. Instead, we use classification criteria. And rather than including everyone, uh, we only include typical patients, and we do that for the purpose of uh, uh, conducting studies. For instance, if you want to know what, if a specific drug 
works in a uh, disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, you want the most typical patient you can find uh, so that the answer is very clear. The downside of that is that uh, there is no information about uh, people who don't fit, who are atypical, who don't fit uh, any uh, standard definition. Uh, but in common parlance, in the press, in the, uh, on television, in when doctors talk to patients, uh, they seldom make the distinction between diagnostic criteria, which I say uh, don't really exist for the autoimmune diseases, and classification criteria, which uh, exclude almost everyone who has a confusing diagnosis. Next, please. Now, why don't people meet criteria, whether you talk about uh, diagnostic or uh, more particularly uh, classification criteria? Well, there are many patients who have too few symptoms, and this is has a number of names associated with it, like incomplete lupus or pre-lupus or uh, something like that, uh, undifferentiated connective tissue disease. There are others where there are too many symptoms. A patient looks like the patient uh, has both features of scleroderma and lupus simultaneously, or rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. We use those terms over overlap, uh, but they, these, these patients are also generally excluded from uh, studies. Uh, illnesses change over time, as I mentioned with the patient with whom I wrote a book, uh, a diagnosis of, because of treatment, because of aging, because of damage that occurs, uh, the disease turns to another one. Every year, or pretty much almost every month with the new genetic studies, there are uh, new diagnoses being carved out of old ones. Uh, there's this one called Vexus syndrome is the most recent, which it turns out to be uh, having, it was once called lupus, it's now a genetic disease uh, and it's separable from the others. And finally, uh, doctors sometimes just plain disagree. They see the same findings. Is your joint swollen or is it not? And so, and disagree about the, uh, the label. So a patient may see one physician who says it's X, another physician says, no, it's not, it's Y. Uh, and that adds to uh, uncertainty. Next, please. How often uh, does this occur? Uh, I could ask you to answer that question in your own mind, but I'll now show you what our own experience has been. Next, please. A few years ago, we looked at uh, over a thousand patients who had carried a diagnosis of lupus, uh, all of whom I had personally seen. Of those thousand patients, 56% had certain diagnoses, that is diagnoses that fit classification criteria. Uh, of those, only 35% had nothing else and 21% had uh, some form of overlap disease. So we could count, we could comfortably use the term uh, lupus for 56% of uh, patients. Next, please. Conversely, uh, of the 44% that would, did not have uh, classifiable lupus, some were there because they had only abnormal blood tests found for reasons that may or may not be clear. Lots of people had uh, joint pains without anything particularly sp specific. And then we have sp uh, separate uh, definitions for what we call mixed connective tissue disease and undifferentiated connective tissue disease. I'll answer questions about that if, if you want, but it's uh, uh, too detailed to get into right now. Next, please. Why do we use diagnosis names? Well, obviously to communicate uh, 
uh, and the patients have to talk to doctors, doctors have to talk to patients, public reports all the time, uh, television uh, news uh, reports on diagnoses uh, all the time, almost never defining what they mean diagnose, by diagnosis. They just assume if they say lupus, they don't put boundaries on that diagnosis. Uh, we use diagnosis names to treat, uh, and that's based on uh, both uh, clinical studies and on basic science. Uh, and in those cases, we're generally using restricted definitions of uh, a diagnosis. That is the, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Uh, the very typical patients, but not the uh, atypical one. Uh, we use diagnosis names because we have to. I don't know how many of you look at your charts if you have access to them, but the bottom line of all, every <clears throat> doctor's note lists the uh, code for that diagnosis. And if you don't give the right code, uh, you don't get paid. And finally, uh, policies at uh, public health level, at uh, research funding like National Institutes of Health, uh, and then uh, uh, even things like managing uh, the COVID epidemic uh, requires the use of uh, diagnosis names uh, to move forward. Next, please. Uh, so we come to that uh, 44% who have uncertain diagnoses. The problems are that treatment rules are not clear for this group of patients. There are seldom any uh, clinical trials that uh, include them. Uh, and so physicians are left to uh, make some guesses. I've mentioned, and you obviously feel very strongly about the fact that uh, uh, insurers don't pay for uncertainty. And I'll tell you, and every physician uh, who's here will know, yeah, we spend hours a week fighting those decisions. Uh, and finally, atypical patients are generally excluded from all trials. Uh, so it's, there's no real information about whether they will or will not respond to specific treatments. Next, please. Uh, I'm going to digress a little bit only because it amuses me, but it also is relevant to how doctors think. Uh, diagnoses, uh, the concept of diagnosis doesn't take into account the time frame in which something occurs. Obviously, a fracture, seizure uh, uh, occur in basically instant time. you you have it one minute, the next minute you don't, and it's pretty definitive. Other illnesses uh, like fever and cough and, and so on uh, occur in what I refer to as clock time. Uh, and that's uh, over hours or days, something develops and it either uh, uh, leads to medical uh, intervention or it subsides spontaneously uh, and uh, oftentimes without tests being done. So diagnosis is a supposition, but it's not a fact. Calendar time is happens over months to years. And uh, is what characterizes most of our uh, illnesses, that is the autoimmune illnesses <clears throat> with uh, things evolving over time, uh, symptoms, and being not very specific, like joint pain or weight loss or fatigue. And finally, uh, there is what I refer to as generational time, which uh, you look at not only the illness that you had uh, 10 years ago, but what the treatment has done to it, what the disease has progress to if it has, uh, what levels of disability you are, and what normal aging will do. Uh, and these all uh, uh, reflect uh, 
what the meaning of having a diagnosis is. And then the digression is that uh, when I was much younger, my wife and I spent a great deal of time in uh, uh, Central America looking at the Maya civilization. So on the next slide, uh, I was fascinated by the what is referred to as a Maya calendar. And it's also an instant clock calendar and generational uh, time. Uh, and they had symbols for this uh, king, which was a one day uh, 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 time frame, 20 days, 360 days, roughly a year, and then a generational time. And the reason I like that, and this is just my own amusement that I'm doing that on the next slide, is that I didn't realize at this time, next slide, please, that it, I had a picture of my wife photographing one of the glyphs on a monument in Copan, Honduras, and it turned out to be Katun, the generational time, and it predicted where I was going to go with my uh, uh, understanding of medicine. Next, please. Uh, diagnoses are uncertain because individuals change in time, as I've told you, and also because science changes. When you get a new genetic uh, discovery, you find a new uh, mo molecule that we refer to as cytokines or cell surface markers and so on. We begin to understand things differently. But if I told you that in 1990, you had uh, lupus by this definition. In 2000, we'd be using a different definition. In 2010, we'd be using a different definition. And in 2020, still even a uh, even more different definition. The definitions, however, no one acknowledges that a 1990 definition is not the same as a, uh, a 2022 definition. Next slide, please. Uh, there are other things, as I uh, already mentioned, that influence how diagnoses are made. They have to do with uh, psychosocial factors and, uh, and personal factors like sex, race, heritage, religion, beliefs. And there are economic factors uh, and access to care. That is, richer patients with better access are more likely to get uh, investigated in more depth uh, and uh, have more subtlety to their diagnoses than are those who uh, are, don't have easy access uh, to care. Uh, and just need to be put through a system where someone stamps a diagnosis name. Next, please. So this is a different concept. And one is that a diagnosis is always yes or no. It's called a binary uh, way of looking at it. A different way of thinking of a diagnosis is to consider part of a spectrum. Uh, it's an, an analog uh, analysis. <clears throat> so for instance, next slide. In a binary definition, the various diseases, and I didn't mean to uh, exclude any or uh, put them in an order that uh, has any particular importance, but in a binary diagnosis, you either have or don't have undifferentiated connective disease or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Some people would take um, uh, uh, the combination of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis together as, and call it lupus. Uh, that's not an official definition. Uh, and uh, uh, Sjogren's syndrome. But if you looked at it from the uh, analog point of view, Next slide. It looks more like this. Uh, patients uh, drift slowly from one section to another uh, with no clear boundaries 
uh, in between the diagnoses. You just are more like 90% rheumatoid arthritis with 10% lupus symptoms uh, and so on. And then you uh, have to consider also the effect of time and next uh, slide. This is where uh, I think our world is going. We talk about illness from its very beginning. Uh, with You look at susceptibility and family history and gene abnormalities. Some people will use the diagnosis name for that. Others will use the name uh, uh, if there's a trigger factor that's known, infection is a common one of them. Uh, others will use diagnosis name for the first time uh, when symptoms occur or when treatment occurs. And then they keep using that name uh, with uh, as the disease evolves, as damage occurs and so on. So to put it in one way of thinking, uh, every a patient with a di specific diagnosis can fit almost any spot in this graph. Next, please. Okay. So where are we going to go uh, with this? Well, I said that we have diagnosis names in 2022. I think that we are moving to an era when we're going to use only very broad diagnosis names uh, uh, that include all the overlaps and the undifferentiated and uh, others and consider them as part of, uh, of a spectrum. Uh, if we do that, we can often uh, identify risk factors that uh, uh, allow us to prevent uh, disease. You can say you have, based on your genetics, your environment, your uh, laboratory tests right now, you have a 5% chance of developing a disease like lupus, uh, or you have a 25% chance or 70% chance. And it's somewhere along that line, uh, the uh, decision will be made that intervention is a benefit uh, rather than uh, 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 injury. R rheumatology or autoimmune diseases are uh, following a lead right now of national studies on type 1 diabetes. That's the juvenile type diabetes, which now can predict with high accuracy uh, children who are going to develop diabetes. And there are now ongoing intervention trials to prevent the development of the disease in the people at very high risk. Uh, those at low risk are not uh, eligible for the study. Uh, and so what we're going to do is base our treatments uh, on the individuality uh, in the in individual biologies of uh, patients. And that'll include family histories and everything else, laboratory tests. Uh, and we will not use specific uh, diagnosis names. Uh, when we do this type of approach, uh, we can possibly cure, uh, uh, talk about cure. Uh, uh, we can, and both prevention and cure are far from where we are today, but I see them being possible in the future. And next, please. Now, the conference that we had uh, about diagnostic uncertainty had the following points. Next, what doctors should do, and then when they do that, when they should do that, how they reduce uncertainty, and even more importantly, how they use uncertainty. Next, please. Well, what we can do today and what we should be doing today is operating very early on the issue of uh, preventing humiliation. Uh, this is a virtually 100% uh, concern of uh, 
patients, they, when they talk to their doctors, their family, their friends, their coworkers, their employers, their insurers, uh, they just simply are not believed or not accepted. Uh, but they're a real population and we need to do that. The second is that there are things that we can know based on today's science and we should uh, be, uh, use that information to the best we can to make uh, rational decisions. Uh, and then finally, we should acknowledge and reduce and use uncertainty. And how do we do that? Next, please. To reduce uncertainty, uh, what we need to do, and this is on my tour, if not yours, we need to have uh, consensus vocabularies so that if I say the term lupus and the, uh, uh, somebody on television says the term lupus or someone funding grants from NIH, uh, we all are talking about the same sort of thing. Uh, we need to have uh, lots of input into how to use these names. Uh, and it's going to come from the scientific world rather than from the uh, sociological world. We're going to uh, distinguish between biological purposes for using diagnosis names, in which case we can target uh, uh, specific abnormalities that we find, and we can do individualized interventions without uh, uh, having to have a specific name. Uh, we also need to uh, use societal purposes. We need to be able to take records uh, keep records, we need to have public health policies, we need to have communications. I think this will be understandable if we have a consensus vocabulary. Uh, in the workshop, uh, we also made a big point of engaging all stock stakeholders, because it isn't just the doctors and the patients who are concerned, uh, it's society at large, it's uh, uh, pretty much every way in which we communicate uh, and we need to have their inputs as well when we uh, create a common uh, definition. And we now have uh, new computer methods, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, this is a very complicated field, but it will allow us to resort uh, so that uh, I think in another decade or so we're gonna have different names than we're using today. Next, please. We can use uncertainty. Um, uh, it, and particularly when we're using computer uh, forms of making diagnoses, we can label something as a highly likely 90% certainty or highly unlikely 10% certainty. And we can include that in the calculation that uh, allows us to make a decision about uh, intervention or treatment. We can stratify or group individual patients according to that uh, level of certainty. And so treat someone who has uh, basically 100% uh, likelihood of having a diagnosis, the typical diagnosis in one way, but allow us greater freedom to treat those patients with less certain diagnoses a 30% or 40% probability in different ways. We need to spend much more time thinking about the effects of time, uh, both in, in individuals and uh, to consider the effects of time on uh, changing science. Next, please. So uh, my point is that symptoms are, and uh, clinical findings are the issue, not the name. Uh, we should be focusing on the details and not on what we call something. Uh, generally, uh, if a diagnosis is uncertain, uh, patients do better. Uh, they tend to have milder disease. And so that's reassuring to patients. Uh, and we need to emphasize again that if I don't have a diagnosis name, uh, I don't have a problem. Uh, 
uh, people are ill, they hurt, they're exhausted, uh, and so on. And this again, I'll go back to uh, the book with uh, Alita uh, uh, Brill and myself. Uh, she said very clearly, I am still me. And she spent her life outside of the realm of thinking of herself as ill, but rather uh, how to manage life with a uh, the hindrance that she did have. Next, please. So can, to conclude, um, I have a series of uh, rules. Number one is in the world of medicine, rheumatologists are the ones who live most easily with uncertainty. Uh, and we can uh, use it uh, uh, strongly. It's powerful. We can break it into uh, workable segments. We can measure it. We can manage it. We can exploit it. We can always consider the effect of time, always consider uh, patient individuality, and we can share information. Uh, next slide. And my final conclusion is that I always conclude with a quote from Proust, uh, who said, uh, if at least enough time is left to me to finish my work, I would describe there how men occupy a space much larger than that. So restricted them in space, uh, in time. Next, please. So my uh, final statement is in 10, 25, 50 years, we're going to have a very different world. We'll know more, well, diagnosis names will change, and we're going to be treating patients on individual uh, factors that we can identify and not on diagnosis names. So I thank you for that. I think that was my last slide. Uh, and we have time for some questions.